Wash our feet with the last session. Okay, thank you. I was not anticipating a love offering because you have all paid for registration to come. So that was his idea, not my idea. In 2006, a Polish pastor walked into my office and said, Pastor, God has told me you will fulfill my dream. I didn't like that. I didn't like the fact that he had heard from God and God hadn't told me. Uh, that was very much his nature. He was a bit of a... They can't hear me at the back? Can you hear or not? So <clears throat> he said, when are you going to England next? And I said, this was February. I said, I'm going in, in June. He said, you will go to Poland. Wasn't, would you like to go? You will go to Poland. I said, oh, I've, got, I've got four days free. I'm going to Hungary and, and Romania. You will go to Poland. I will arrange it. He didn't tell me I had to pay my own fare, <laughs> pay, for the, pay for the meals at the pastor's house or pay for the petrol on the pastor's car. He said, I want you, I said, what is your dream? He said, I want to plant a church in Poland. I thought, you are stupid. It's for me to do that. The Polish language is horrific. Apologies to all Polish people here. Anybody got Polish roots? Good. <laughs> you, you should never trust the language that's got more letter Zs than vowels. Anyway. And it's a long way away. It's a, and I didn't even like going to preach at his church, let alone plant it. Impossible. But four months later, I find myself in Ustron in southern Poland. And I'm waiting in the pastor's office on a Monday evening to preach at a meeting that's been arranged. Into the office walks the Polish superintendent of the Polish Pentecostal churches, and I know him. He's been part of our Shepherd Storehouse network. Didn't realise that. After the meeting, he said, you know, what do you come for? I told him about the guy in Adelaide, and he said, and I told him about a town called Tarnoff, and he said, well, that town has now got a church. But he said, this is my assistant, uh, uh, Michael Andre, Andre Lubas, and he wants to go to Chehovitsa. And there is a town of 30,000 people, no gospel preaching church. So if you double the size of Mariba, no church, no gospel preaching church. So I said, well, he said, if, if, if you can help him, we'll release him and a couple, uh, maybe a dozen people and they can go and plant a church. I said, you need to know that I don't have any money. But my wife and I, we have some partners, so we will pay his wage at the basic wage of Poland for two years so he can plant the church. On the 1st of January 2007, a church was planted in a Polish town where there was no gospel preaching church. Today, that church is um, about 90 strong uh, and I've been back many times because the arrangement for supporting them was that they had to be in connection to the national leadership. They had to report back to me and they had to be willing for me to preach for them. Because a preacher sums up a church just from the atmosphere. You just take a deep breath and you know where the church is at. So that was so successful that uh, two years later, because we were only going to support them for two years, Otherwise, you, um, you, you become God for them. It takes away their motivation. It's just for two years, then you're on your own financially. So two years later, we did it again. Two years after that, we did it again. And two years after that, we did it twice. And uh, since 2007, we've been able to plant 10 churches. I think I told you, one died, one merged. Eight are doing very well. Over the last couple of years, our, our, our direction has changed a little in that now we are helping the church plants that we've made to get their own buildings. It's difficult for us to understand, but in a Catholic 
country, if you don't have your own dedicated building, you're considered a false cult. You've got to meet in a sanctified building. Can you understand the Catholic concept? And so we helped Chehovitsa, maybe raised about 20% of, of the funds. I can show you the picture of the church. Uh, and then uh, a couple of years later, uh, in a place called Vatswabek, the, um, the pastor met me and took me to lunch. He said, I've got a surprise for you. He said, see that building over there? And he pointed to a, what, what, what was the building like? He told me it was very nice. Thank you. So he said, we've got permission to lease that for 25 years. It's at a lower lease than the shop we're leasing in the suburbs. We're now in the city centre. And um, the building was about 150 years old, very classic uh, building. And he said, in the Second World War, it was used by the Gestapo as uh, their centre. And on the door was a plaque with the names of 18 Poles and Jews that were murdered in that building. So we, we helped them, raised again about 20% of the cost so that they can have their own building. But, so it's slightly different. Now we have another one of our church plants in Warsaw. Uh, Warsaw prices are Australian prices. It's the capital city. You know, their wages are not our wages, but their prices, their real estates. So we've, com we've connected to a Michael Sicek. We supported him for two years. And uh, it's called Church for Warsaw. They've grown to about 80 or 90. I said to him last time I was there, which was November of the previous year, I said, you need to start a future fund. Just start collecting money for your own building. And so over the last uh, 14, 15 months, uh, Michal Sicek has been... He's done a couple of things. He's now leasing his building to groups that are looking for a church building. Do you understand? Particularly, particularly Ukrainians. You, you may not be aware, but the, the war between Russia and the Ukraine continues. And they are slowly, the Russians are slowly pushing the Ukrainians westward. And there are large numbers of Ukrainians migrating into Poland, many of whom are Pentecostal Christians and uh, are looking for places to gather. And to, so Michal has got uh, three Ukrainian congregations now using his building. Now, that's pretty smart. I think it's smart because w why use a building for three hours on a Sunday? You know, let, let's multiple, multiple use. Uh, and then he has a Spanish-speaking congregation. So he said to me, Pastor, we've got five, um, five groups now using our building. And he said, the good thing is that none of them have got pastors. They've appointed me as the pastor. So uh, now the general president of our movement thinks I'm a hero because I've planted five new churches. <laughs> so uh, they are, it's going to cost them a million Australian. They've seen a building, uh, and it's an it's a impressive building. The, the, the Polish churches, they, they will have an auditorium like this, but they'll have three levels. And the second level, the pastor and his wife will have a flat where they live. And the third level, what might be conference rooms or accommodation, it's, it's, it's a little different. Some of these buildings don't look like churches, but they are churches, are church buildings. So um, the, the five groups, he can actually pay a mortgage. The cash flow will be there to support a mortgage, but he needs a third deposit. So 300 grand. So uh, he started his future fund and has raised about $40,000, which I, I think is great. And I said, we're going to start saving as well. And so Bernice and I, through our ministry of the Shepherd's Storehouse, and you know that the sale of those books doesn't go to our pension fund. It, it's going towards this project. So we've collected about $15,000 so far. Uh, so, so my goal, they, they think that settlement will be September beyond, beyond September this year. So you, know, you just do what you can because everything you give to missions comes back to you. So I have no idea what was in the love offering, but let me tell you that we will probably double tithe on that into our Polish fund. Do you understand that?
So I'm telling that just to encourage your faith. And you might say, well, Jeremy, here's 100 bucks for Poland. Mm. Just nudge the person next to you and say, he's talking to you. Um, so on our third church plant, maybe our fourth church plant, we're now meeting, having a conference, a planning session in Warsaw at their Bible college, and uh, the leaders from the different regions are there. And so I'm saying to them, can you tell me the name of a person and the name of a town where we can partner with? And so they're giving various suggestions. But the bishop's there. They call their, their president the bishop. So he says, well, let me tell you that there is uh, Wojciech Visapal, and he's a student at this college, and he wants to go to, I can't say this place, it's the Polish word for cross, and it's something like, I can't say it. And he wants to go there. There's no church, no church, 13,000 people, no church. So the principal of the college says, oh, Wojtek is on the campus. Let's go and get him. So they go up to his room and bring him down, and they explain to him that there is a group of churches in Australia that will support him for two years to plant a church in Cross. Russia. He says, I was on my knees. I'm about to get married. And I want to go and plant a church. How can I do this? How will I be able to provide for my new wife when I get an invitation to come to this meeting and discover that a group of Australians are going to help me do it? That's the miraculous. That's what we need. With all our strategies, we actually need a sense of the miraculous. He went to a town, 13,000 people. He's got more than 100, and he's got an outreach into another city. Uh, that's a good investment. And he's got a wife and a couple of kids. That's even better. So how many children do you want? I'm just now looking. <laughs> okay, here we go. Do, do you mind me telling these stories? Let me ask you, what's happening to your faith? What's happening to your faith? Oh, can, can I tell you another story? Everything you give to missions comes back to you. God spoke to me in December 2008, those words, on a, Saturday, uh, on a Wednesday morning in a, uh, a prayer meeting, 6 o'clock. And it happened this way. I'd, I'd received an anonymous letter on my office desk from somebody in the church who resented the fact that we'd put a Christmas tree on the stage. Oh, and she gave me, you know, she gave me the reason because Santa is the same letters of Satan. Has anybody ever mixed up the letters of God? It's crazy. It's crazy. And I thought, I am wasting my time. And God said to me, I haven't called you to heights. I've called you to the world. I said, thank you, Jesus. Then he said, I want you to take heights to the world. Kicking and screaming. Then he said, everything you've given to missions will come back to you. That year, we'd given about 40 grand to missions. Not a lot of money, but it was 40,000. Six weeks later, a man walked into my office and he said, Pastor, I have $40,000 for you. And I remembered everything you've given to missions will come back. I immediately think, because my Mitsubi my Magna was going to heaven. You know, it, was, it had passed the point of, it was definitely destined to heaven. $40,000. And instantly the guy said to me, oh, it's not for you. It's for Bolivia. Okay. And he told me, he said, he said uh, 10 years ago, I went to Cochabamba on a missionary tour to visit an, uh, an Australian missionary called Julia Love. Ever heard that name? And uh, found a little church. And I said to the pastor, 
what can we do to help you? And she said, in this area, a school. He went back to Australia and started saving his pension. The guy was uh, an invalid pensioner. He had chronic obstructive airways disorder. And uh, then he had an inheritance. He tithed on that and came to me with $40,000. He said, it's for Bolivia. I had learned from Poland that if you give money to mission agencies, they take a big slice called administration. They can do it. It's okay. It's legal. Not, not illegal. Quite acceptable. But <clears throat> there are better ways. If you go there personally. So I said, we should go. We should go to Bolivia and find this church and see what we can do. So we agreed. This man is now um, 70s, early 70s. Still got that chronic obstructive airways disorder. Because on, on, the, on a wedding anniversary, he nearly died. Remember that? On, on their wedding anniversary, he has this attack, can't breathe, kissed his wife and nearly died. How many men understand that? You know, sort of. <laughs> so we agreed to go. This was February. In the month of May, let me pause and say we had prayed for Chris many times. We had prayed for him many times and God hadn't healed him. In the month of May on a Monday, he has a serious breathing attack or lack of breath. And uh, his wife says, that's it. You, you need to, you can't go unless... I come with you, she was a nurse, and secondly, your specialist allows you. So they ring up, and because of the seriousness of his condition and the, um, the attack on the Monday, he gets to see the specialist on the Tuesday. Two hours, tests, scans, blood tests, lung capacity, the works. And at the end of two hours, the specialist says, I made a mistake because you don't have that disease. So the guy says, um, you've been treating me for 10, 10 years. I've got a box full of your reports. I've got reports where you say, uh, Chris is displaying every symptom of this disease progressing. Oh, I made a mistake because you haven't got it. And it's actually irreversible and incurable. So yeah, he, he was com comfortable saying a mistake because it's easier to say a mistake than another M word. Miracle. So Cochabamba is 8,000 feet up. So the air's thin. I'm serious, the air's thin. Uh, he and his wife go. I'm going to Poland and then going down to Bolivia. And by the time I get there, they've already been to the church. In fact, they arrived on a Wednesday and said to the man that met them at the airport, how is the church in Alto Cochabamba going? Alto is Spanish for heights. We were in a church in Adelaide called Heights, and this church is called Cochabamba Heights. <laughs> yeah, significant, isn't it? So, um, so they went on the Wednesday night in a building, not dissimilar to this, full of Quechua Indians. Bolivian women, they are odd. They wear bowler hats. They wear these skirts that, that I don't know how, you, you want to check, they're all little people as well. So when two Europeans walk in, they stand out. The pastor looks around and sees them. Now, she actually met the man 10 years before, but 10 years is a long time. She walks to the back and she says, as we come about the children, we've been praying for 10 years the children as we come about the children so today hundreds of kids have been in our school uh, the, the Roman Catholic priest banned any Catholics from attending that just gave room for others <laughs> this is terrible poverty absolute poverty but everything you give to missions comes back to you there's no limit to what you can do there's no limit you can do. But all you have to do is have the courage to walk through the door that God opens for you. It will be, when I get tired, I get distracted. And right now, I'm seriously tired. Keep going, okay, keep going, okay. Uh, this is page 16. Was that interesting? Did it build your faith? 
Okay, here we go. A regular and important part of church services are short devotions given before sharing communion and receiving the offering. Do we all have little devotions at communion and offering messages? Uh, are we all familiar with this? These devotions, here we go, are great opportunities to develop a person's preaching skill. Don't think of it, oh, I've got to give a message at communion. This is an opportunity for you to grow. It's always a privilege to share at communion and when receiving the offering. Underline the next statement. Always aim at adding to the meeting. If you're invited to do something, you should say to yourself, what can I do that will contribute and build the meeting? Did you hear what I said? Okay, next Next sentence, next paragraph. It is important, underline, to accept the time frame that is allocated and to strictly adhere to it. It is equally important to understand that the communion and offering devotions are not the main event of the meeting. What's the main event? The main event is the preaching of the word of God. It should all point towards that. Why? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Do you understand? That's why you're here today. You want to learn how to preach. So the main event is preaching. It is difficult for the preacher to resurrect a meeting following a communion devotion that has lasted for 20 minutes and a 10-minute offering message. I am serious. Have you ever had that experience? Somebody stands up and goes on for 20 minutes on communion. How on earth do you preach after that? And I'm serious. You, you actually trust the person. You say to them, I want to speak. I want you to speak for five minutes. But they think five minutes is 20 minutes. They don't understand that five means when the clock goes. See that one where that big hand goes to two, that's five minutes. Now, uh, do you understand that? So, so look what it says there. I consider that both... Um, Communion and offering, how do you resurrect something that's being killed by somebody rambling on? I consider that both communion and offering devotion should last no more than five minutes. This is a definitive time, not an approximate time. Five minutes doesn't mean eight to ten minutes. It means 300 seconds. It's actually more difficult to speak effectively for five minutes than for 30 minutes. It's actually harder to do that. So, prepare well. Underline that. Therefore, prepare well. Prepare well. And good preparation is the best antidote for fear. The person who does not prepare will ramble. And they'll be difficult for the congregation to follow. And it will add little to the meaning. Everything in the meeting should be building. Did you hear what I said? The song leader should choose songs that are building something. It's, it's not just, choose, oh, well, we, we have five songs, let's choose five songs. No, plan it, think it through. So it's building, building, building. So the worship and the praise is growing, growing, growing. Do, do you understand that? That leads into communion that, that, that is lifting people into a place that they weren't before. And so on. So when the preacher stands up, there's already an atmosphere of revival and renewal in the house. He hasn't got to produce his own atmosphere. Okay. Fourth paragraph. A five minute devotional should have, underline this, one major thought. Don't stand up and say, I've got seven things to tell you about communion. Oh, give me a break. They're never going to do it again. I would not allow them to do it again unless they, you know, shed their blood and said, I'll only do it one. You know. <laughs> one thought, just one thought. Because if it's seven, I've got seven things to say about communion, every one of them is going to take at least two minutes. So how long is that? It's gone for at least 14. And what's happening to the atmosphere? Unless the guy or woman is a brilliant communicator, it's, it's a lead balloon. It really is. One thought. And it must be relevant. We're talking about the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're talking about salvation. We're talking about who we are and what we are in Jesus Christ. 
You know, it, it must be relevant. Don't, don't you, know, you dug out some Old Testament prophecy that, that's blessed you this week. Well, I'm going to share that at communion. It has no relevance to communion. And it mustn't be obscure. It's not an opportunity to introduce an obscure truth that you consider important. A devotional should never be controversial. Oh, well, you need to know that what I'm going to tell you, not everybody believes, but it's in the Bible. <laughs> hey, stick to the middle of the road. The communion table is not a soapbox. What I mean by soapbox is, you know, something that somebody stands on so their voice can be, you understand soapbox? Nor is it a place to express your frustrations. Well, finally, the pastor's given me an opportunity to share. <laughs> he had better duck. <laughs> Some people think, I'm, here's another thing about Pentecostals. Some people think I don't need to prepare. The Holy Spirit will give me the words to say. I will open my mouth and he will fill it. That's a Bible verse, by the way. Open your mouth, I'll fill it. I've observed that when people do that, they say the same thing every time. So something's not quite right. The truth is, the Holy Spirit can equally anoint you as much as when you prepare as when you present the devotion. <laughs> Shall I say that to you again? While I'm preparing my sermon, I sense God's anointing as I prepare. And I'll often say to Bernice, oh, this is going to be a beauty on Sunday because God's already, you know, pouring into my life. And so don't think, in, in one sense, what you see at the front is a reflection of what's already happened in private. So, uh, don't, oh, the Holy Spirit will give me what to say. Okay, let's wait until he's done that. And when he's done it, you can come and tell me and then you can do communion. I'm much more comfortable with that. Prepare well and rehearse well. It's helpful to rehearse the devotion three or four times and time yourself. So you've written it out and you've practiced it and you've got your stopwatch. I do that. I do that because I know what's expected of me in church. And so I've written my sermon and I time it so I know it's not too short, not too long. This builds confidence in what you are saying and that it's neither too long nor too short. When bringing a communion devotion, it is important to underline to give clear instructions on when the bread and juice are to be distributed. I've had people stand up and they just start to share and they're unaware that they've got to ask the people to distribute. So they go on for seven or eight minutes and we're still sitting there without the bread and the wine. So the first thing you do is you ask people, with, the, with the, uh, those that are waiting, those that are ushering, would you please begin to distribute? And when people should eat or drink, whether you do it as you receive or whether you do it together. Be aware of what is happening in the room. Has everyone been served? So maybe, you know, uh, the, I've shared my devotion and only half the people have received the bread and the wine. And if I say, let's eat and drink, half of them haven't got it. Do you understand? So the person that's leading has got to keep their eyes open. Let me tell you, if you're a worship leader, don't close your eyes. You can worship with your eyes open. Who said yes? Thank you. It is true, because we can be so lost in our worship. You know, Bill and George down the back are having a serious argument. Be aware of what's happening. Look around the room. Has everybody been served? Is everybody re ready? It's good to give thanks for the bread and the juice as Jesus did. And you need to rehearse the prayer because I've heard many people say, Father, thank you for dying for me. Now, God, God doesn't grade our prayers. He doesn't sort of be cross. That's not true. It's Jesus that died. Well, it, it, it's, it's not a bad thing to say, but it's rather an immature thing to say. It's sometimes because we get, maybe we're nervous or it's Jesus. So, so work out what you're going to say and practice it. It's quite 
It's quite acceptable for doing that. Over the page. Bringing our monetary offerings is an acceptable part of both Old and New Testament worship. The offering shouldn't be hurried. You've got to give them every opportunity to give. Secondly, <laughs> nor should it be exaggerated. Nor should it be minimized. Oh, let's get rid of the offering. I never hear a pastor say that. Be pleasant. Don't be flippant. It's an act of worship. People resent being manipulated to give. Underline the next statement. Never use guilt as a means to extract more money from people. Because guilt is a short-term motivator that brings, oh, there's a spelling mistake, long-term condemnation. We proofread this carefully, don't we? It is vital that whoever brings the offering devotion totally accepts the local church's philosophy about giving. So if you don't tithe, and the church expects people to tithe, don't invite them to do the offering. Because they'll stand up and they'll say, I don't believe in tithing. They'll say things like, tithing's an Old Testament concept. Uh, I believe in New Testament giving. Well, that's very nice. But it's actually not accurate. 1 Corinthians 16, first day of the week, set aside a sum according to your wage. Jesus said, the Pharisees, they even tithe the herbs in their garden. And so they should, he said. So it's, it's, not, a, it's not an old... Te- this is tithing. Tithing is equal proportionate giving. This is what I believe. If everybody tithed in church, the church would have so much money, they could do whatever they needed to do. I also think... That every church, if every church tithed to missions, we would have so much money for missions we could reach the world. So that's what I believe. So if you're not comfortable with your church's view on giving, don't invite them to do the offering. You know, it'll just cause you heartaches. It is acceptable to share a brief testimony, but underline this delete the unnecessary small details. This week, I visited Sister Mary in hospital. She was in Ward 7B. (laughs) And one of the nurses there, uh, Mary, I went to school with Mary's mother. (laughs) Come on. The, The art of good communication is the ability to use as few words as possible. The blind man's testimony was simple. I was blind, now I can see, and the man called Jesus did it. I mean, what else do you need to say? The blind man didn't say, I was born in Bethesda Hospital. Just, there we go. Underline, it is always helpful to have notes. (laughs) I get terrified. I got to preach. Somebody walks up to do the communion message. They got 15 pages of handwritten notes. And then they have to search which order they're in. If you're going to use pages, put a number on them. And put them in a binder. Ask me why I use a binder, you know, with with these punch things. So the fan won't blow the notes on the floor. Okay, always helpful to have notes. Don't write in paragraphs as you will end up reading and reducing eye contact with the congregation. You should only, if you're doing these five-minute messages, one page of notes. There you go, one page of notes. No more. Reduce, reduce, reduce. If you're going to quote from Scripture, inform the computer technician beforehand so everyone can read the verse. It's impossible to turn to a Bible verse when you're holding the bread and wine. People do that. And I don't want to offend you, some people have clunky, bi- chunky Bibles, a big Bible with this big leather. I'm trying to offend you now. This big leather cover, cover. And, you know, it's a huge thing. So, so uh, this isn't classy, but it's sort of very handy. <laughs> so I never, I never ask people to turn in their Bible because not everybody can find Habakkuk. By the time they found it, you're now preaching from Mark. You know, it's, 
So, so what do you do? You stick it on the, com on the computer. That way you can control the version. Are you with me? And so what I, what I do is that uh, I'll give a copy of the manuscript of my sermon to the computer technician with, with a little asterisk, meaning this is the next slide. So that it all flows smoothly. So uh, don't, don't ask people to turn, because if you've got your hands full of the bread and the wine, you just can't, you know, find a Bible verse. Or if you're filling out your credit card details, you, you can't do that if you're looking for Malachi. Some do's and don'ts. Uh, don't apologize. Oh, I didn't have much time to prepare this week. Well, if you shouldn't do that, you, should, you shouldn't be speaking. Don't say, I wish I had more time. That annoys me. It really annoys me. You know, somebody's got five minutes, and they use three minutes telling you it's not enough time. Just shut up and get on with it. Number three, don't talk too much about yourself. It's not about you. It's not about you. What you should do, always encourage, always encourage, always build up, always encourage, always encourage. Never condemn people. Don't make people feel guilty. Always encourage. Always make a deposit. Be positive. Be enthusiastic. Be happy. Be relaxed. And five minutes means five minutes. D.L. Moody. Anybody have heard of D.L. Moody? Great preacher in the 19th century. He, he had these combined church crusades. And... Uh, he despised long prayers, and he would frequently, halfway the, through the long prayer, we don't know if it was halfway because he didn't get finished, <laughs> he would say, brother, you can sit down now. Because if he saw people getting restless or whatever, he's thinking there are lost souls that need Jesus. And some guy wants his voice to be heard, you know, sit down. Okay, you are the message. The congregation is more interested in you than the words you are saying. Underline the next statement. Preaching is not writing an essay and reading it. Here's a problem for Bible college students. We teach them in Bible college how to write assignments. And they then think that writing a sermon is like writing an assignment. Big mistake. Sermons are not meant to be read, they are meant to be preached. Because if it's meant to be read, we can just email the sermon to them. We don't, we don't need to do it. Communication is 7% words, 38% tone of voice, 55% body language. What are you talking about, Jeremy? God loves you. What have I just said? He's angry. My tone of voice has totally confused you today. I am preaching on joy yeah. because my, my heart overflows with joy. What are you hearing? What are you hearing? If that's joy, you don't want it. Is, is this true? So, I love you. <laughs> that's that's very romantic, isn't it? You know, you, it's got to be the it's got to be the tone of voice, Steve. You know, so. I love you. And and body language. I think Italians have an advantage because you know they speak with their hands. Um. Power preaching uses all those things in the power of the Holy Spirit. Underline the next statement. Preaching is being the message and sharing yourself. It is truth wrapped in personality. You cannot separate the message from the messenger. Therefore, determine to grow. Our interest in you goes beyond this session. I will do whatever I can, we will do whatever we can to equip you. Honey, can you, can you read, write our email address on there? And would you do that? Yes, please. You're not good at writing on the board. 
Okay, Mrs. Writing on the board, can you please help us? Just give her the address. Oh, it's there, is it? Don't worry, don't worry. Where is it? On the back page, under the order. There it is, sorry, thank you. You see, before they call, God answers. You don't need to clean that off. We, I don't need your services anymore, thank you. So. Excuse me. I want you to lift your hands towards her. Kate, we bless you in the name of Jesus. You are a gift to Steve. You're a gift to the church. And so I put my hands on you and pray everything I want for my own daughter. I pray for the anointing of God and the gift of God to rise up. And I say to you, Kate, rise up, you woman of God. Rise up, you woman of God. I pray that you'll take of my gift and throw it over Kate in the name of Amen. Amen. Get ready. Get ready. I know you're having a little time out. It's only a little time. It's only a little time. Keep saying to your husband, time's getting close, honey. Time's getting close. Rise up, you man of God. Rise up. I, didn't, I wasn't marrying a husband who'd sit at home. I was marrying a man of God who'd bring fire down from heaven and you know, get in the lion's den and the fiery furnace. That, that's what I was expecting, so... Everything down out of your hands. Okay, have empty hands. You cannot receive when your hands are full of other things. Did you hear what I said? 